let's stand and sing because he did. to the city in Judah where my ancestors are buried so that I can rebuild it. 
Then the king, with the queen sitting beside him, asked me, how long will your journey take and when will you get back? It pleased the king to send me, so I set a time. I also said to him, if it pleases the king, may I have letters to the governors of Trans Euphrates so that they will provide me safe conduct until I arrive in Judah? And may I have a letter to Asaph, keeper of the royal park, so he will give me timber to make beams for the gates of the citadel by the temple and for the city wall and for the residence I will occupy? And because the gracious hand of my God was on me, the king granted my request. So I went to the governors of Trans Euphrates and gave him the king's letters. The king had also given me, had also sent army officers and cavalry with me. When Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite office, official heard about this, they were very much disturbed that someone had come to promote the welfare of the Israelites. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. And now we'll have our prayer of confession, or do you want to do the Lord's Prayer? Let us sing the Lord's Prayer. <laughs>
after turning your bulletins, we'll read the prayer of sacrifice. Our Heavenly Father, we, your servants, desire your fatherly goodness to mercifully accept the sacrifice of our praise and thanksgiving. We humbly ask you to grant that by the merits and the death of your Son, Jesus Christ, and through faith in his blood, we and your whole church may obtain forgiveness of our sins and all other benefits of his passion. Today, we offer and present to you, O Lord, ourselves, our souls and bodies, to be a reasonable, holy, and lively sacrifice unto you. We humbly ask, as we worship you and give ourselves to you, O Holy Union, that we may be filled with your grace and have a man's blessing. Though we are not worthy on our own, we ask your pardon and acceptance in the name of our Lord Jesus the Christ. Amen. Acts chapter 8, verses 1 to 13. And Saul approved of their killing him. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem. And all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. But Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Messiah there. When the crowds heard Philip and saw the signs he performed, they all paid close attention to what he said. For with shrieks, impure spirits came out of many, and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was great joy in the city. Now for some time, a man named Simon had practiced sorcery in the city and amazed all the people of Samaria. He boasted that he was someone great, and all the people, both high and low, gave him their attention and exclaimed, This man is rightly called the great power of God. They followed him because he had amazed them for a long time with his sorcery. But when they believed Philip as he proclaimed the good news of the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Simon himself believed and was baptized. And he followed Philip everywhere, astonished by the great signs and miracles he saw. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You're right. We didn't get any prayer request cards from uh, this service, uh, but there are some that uh, were shared with us in the previous service, and I'll share them with you. Um, there's a, a, a new attendee at the early service, and her name is um, Burl. Burl, and uh, she's make, making two requests, one for someone named Dorothy, uh, who uh, will be having uh, surgery coming up and uh, then also for Burl in healing from a surgery that she had and uh, she's lifting up a praise and, and giving thanks for the prayers that have been on her behalf because the doctors believe that they got all of the cancer that she was suffering from uh, and then uh, there's a request Oh, from this, uh, from Denise here, I just remembered that she, she brought this up earlier. Um, and she's li lifting up prayers for a friend that has liver cancer. And, uh, and she shared that she has some other prayer requests that she's not going to share publicly, but would like our prayers for, for her and hers on behalf of, of that. Um, then... Susie Reinhardt is asking that we 
be in prayer for Israel and for the survivors and uh, that uh, and those uh, prayers for those who have lost loved ones uh, and then I uh, something she wrote here is reminding me that even for the people who are taking pl uh, are, are part of the group of that are Hamas, those who are the terrorists. Jesus said, pray for your enemies. And it's a, it's a hard thing for us to pray for our enemies. Uh, but uh, it's God's preference that their hearts and minds would be changed and that they would become followers of God and followers of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so that's what we can ask for. Uh, in the midst of war and all that's going on, uh, pray for those who would do us harm as well, that God would change hearts. In our reading in Acts today, we're reading in that area when Saul becomes an enemy of the church and uh, persecution breaks out all over Judea and uh, Samaria and, and other cities against the believers in Jesus Christ. And it sounds a lot like that time. So let's go to our Heavenly Father in prayer. Sandy too. What's that? Sandy. Sandy. Oh, yes. And it's not written down, but um, a, a prayer request for Sandy. Um, Y'all have uh, probably have seen the giant uh, dog uh, that he had named Kalua, and um, she suddenly was being affected by a very fast growing bone cancer, and it was very painful, and uh, rather than waiting for it to spread throughout her body and cause pain, he had her put down, uh, put to sleep by the veterinarian. And so his heart is breaking. He, we all know what it is to have a pet a companion, a, a friend, a, a family member that is an animal, and then to uh, lose that one. So keep Sandy in your prayers as well. Father, uh, as we pray for others like the Lee family who, and, uh, and the family of this church who so recently have lost Charlotte to death, uh, but not just to death, but to eternal life life with you. Uh, we, we pray for that family as they experience this sense of loss where she was such an important part of all of their lives and as she was an important part of ours. And we lift up others who've recently lost loved ones, whether um, a family member who is human or a family member that uh, is a pet. Uh, it is still a, a loss and a grief so we pray for Sandy as well. And uh, as we approach Thanksgiving and Christmas, these holidays are times that we remember family who passed uh, and we miss them. They're not with us in those times of celebration. And that can be difficult and painful uh, as we have those holidays and those special days like birthdays uh, that come around when our loved one is gone. So we lift up all who are grieving at this time. Uh, we remember those on the other side of the world, Jews who have lost, Israelis who have lost their family and their homes, where even whole communities um, that everyone has been killed. Uh, and then the same for those that live in the Gaza Strip, uh, and uh, the city is being uh, demolished around them. We pray for those who are losing loved ones, and we pray for those who are <clears throat> wounded in, in, in this horror of war. And we ask, Father, that you would remove the evil sources that are bringing people into war. We lift up others who are sick, a friend with liver cancer, 
one, uh, uh, Dorothy, who needs to have surgery and it may be, may be losing a foot. Uh, we thank you, Lord, for the success of Burl's surgery and the expectation that the doctors have removed all of the cancer. We ask that you continue her healing and that you would uh, <coughs> protect her from further infection of cancer. Father, all of the, in all of these things, so much of which are physical things, we, we don't want to forget the need for us to be praying for the spiritual things. Um, for loved ones who may, uh, certainly know of you, but don't know you. For those who uh, know about rules and regulations of God, but don't understand a relationship with God. Don't believe that there's a such thing. And Father, uh, uh, in a world that seems to be quicker to believe in ghosts, or demons and believe in angels uh, and easy to believe in the powers of sorcery <coughs> but not understanding the power of God that we might have in relationship with you. Uh, we ask, Father, that you would so work in our lives that we would be strengthened in the Word of God, that we might share the Word of God, that we, and we ask that we would experience your work in our lives and give witness or testimony that you are a God who works in our lives, that others might yearn to have you work in their lives. And help us to be quick to speak the truth of your word, that others may know the source of the power that we may have, the life-changing power. We ask these things in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. <laughs>
His words are your words. The words that you would have us to know for our own individual needs and desires. We ask you, Lord, to look upon him with favor and bless him. Thank you, Father, for all of your blessings. In Jesus' name, amen. Invite the children to head on out to Children's Church. Jimmy, you have to stay. broke out against the church in Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judah, or Judea, and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him, but Saul began to destroy the church, going from house to house. He dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. This passage reminded me of uh, some of what we've been seeing in the news in these past weeks. And uh, to think about how this has been going on close to 3,000 years, the, uh, the hatred and persecution, the attempts to uh, eradicate a people and we've seen it so many times in so many places because of who they are. Uh, I've been hearing the, the news talk about um, racism in the midst of this war that's been imposed upon Israel. Uh, racism. And the first time I heard it being accused that uh, Israel was uh, racially motivated in their uh, defenses against the attacks that were coming out of Gaza, uh, the first thought that came to my mind is that, uh, well, it has nothing to do with race. They are of the same race. <laughs> if you're going to say the uh, genetic origins of a people, um, 3,000 years ago, uh, and even, but, well, uh, about 3,000 years ago, Abram came from Persia. And these descendants of Abram that are the people of Israel and the descendants of Abram who are uh, the people of uh, Ishmael and Esau, uh, they are all descendants of Abraham. Uh, so even by the modern uh, political world that talks about racism and different races, uh, it's, it's not accurate to say it's racially motivated. They're from the same genetics, the same origin, going back to Abram. Now granted, the, there's mixed in there um, some European blood with people that were Jews who went to Europe and, and married Europeans, uh, and there, uh, there's a mix in both sides uh, from other nationalities outside of descendants, the Arabs and the Jews. Because whenever a large kingdom went to war and swooped, swoop, uh, swooped across the land, uh, they would conquer kingdoms and they would take people from those kingdoms and scatter them amongst other kingdoms that were conquered so that the, the uh, history and the culture was getting all mixed around. But then I've been asserting for a while based on science 
when I went through college and was studying uh, uh, all of the sciences having to do with biology uh, because I was uh, entering into the pre-med program. Uh, one of the things that we learned early on, even before college, is that there's one race. When we're talking about different races, um, there, there's just one race, the human race. And in the divisions, uh, that there's humanity. And uh, the, the whole idea that we have people of different colors are coming from different races was just a lie perpetrated by those who wanted to say that it was scientific that a particular group of people were subhuman. That's right. They're not quite human. And to continue to try to make these distinctions between people who are black or brown, I don't know, I'm not quite sure why we say yellow when we're talking about Asian, but from different regions, people from different regions and origins and cultures are somehow different races doesn't fit the science. But what we're seeing is, is because the culture is different, people will persecute, and, and mostly because of the desire for power and to take what belongs to someone else. And we see what's happening here. Now Saul believed that he uh, was uh, killing the Christians because they were turning upside down the Jewish faith. That he believed that they were uh, a, a, uh, like a cancer that needed to be cut out of their religious faith. And, and it's intriguing to me that that's where those are, who are of Arabic descent, um, calling themselves Palestinians, uh, from a place called Palestine, that, didn't exist a Palestine in the not too distant past. It, it was just identified by Europeans after World War II that uh, we're going to have this area called Palestine and that's where the people who are there now can get pushed over to there while we give Israel back to the Jews. Not all of Israel, just part of what had been Israel in the scriptures. And so here in Paul's day, he's seeing this threat of Christianity, those following this person called Christ, those saying that the Messiah has come, that Jesus was the anointed one. How dare they claim that Jesus was the anointed one? They need to be killed and thrown in prison and tortured and gotten rid of. But when the apostles learned that, uh, uh, well, when, when the persecution began, they, most of the people other than the apostles were scattered. And that's kind of intriguing because the apostle, apostle means those who were sent out. And they had been sent out to proclaim uh, the good news about God with us uh, all over the northern and southern kingdom of Israel. And, uh, and as they went out to proclaim and then come back and report to Jesus, there was twice that they went out and came back as 12 and then as 72 or 70. Maybe it was twice to be 70 and 72, but at any rate, um, but when the persecution happened, they stayed in Jerusalem, and the others got scattered all over, all of the other believers. And that they got scattered because they were running away from the danger. Um, and so, but as they went, what were they doing? Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. They shared the good news of God with us. And in so doing, there were people who believed. And as they heard, they sent Peter and, um, oh, I should tell you that uh, verses, uh, Acts chapter 1, verses 1 through 13, um, that was read uh, earlier, and, uh, and, but I'm going to really focus now on the verses that follow that, in verse 14 through 24. When the apostles in Jerusalem heard that, that, that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to Samaria. 
Okay? Two of the twelve that had been with Jesus through the whole time, they sent them to go and to, um, to make sure that all of these new believers can get on a, on a right start with that. And when they arrived, they prayed for the new believers that they, that they might receive the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit had not yet come on any of them. And they had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus and believed in his name. So Peter and John placed their hands on those new believers uh, and they received the Holy Spirit. Now, it wasn't a magic touch that just Peter and John had. It's, it's not that Philip didn't have the magic touch. But as they went and uh, the believers were there and they prayed specifically that God would uh, pour out his Holy Spirit on those people. One of the things that I think is important for us to recognize is that just because someone believes about Jesus, that doesn't mean that they are now filled with the Holy Spirit. A lot of times that's assumed that when I decided to believe in Jesus and to be a follower of Jesus, to be a Christian, that I'm automatically receive the Holy Spirit. Um, but God pours out the Holy Spirit in, in, in people. And what we see from Scripture is that there's, uh, there's, there's that point in our life when we decide that we believe about God and we want to follow God, and we maybe even start in that process, but we haven't yet really surrendered our whole life to Him. And I'm sure that each of you remember it. Uh, occasionally, it's a kabam, and and you uh, you know you have that lightning flash, and and you are all in. Uh, but most of the time, it's a growing process, and Jesus describes it as that. When we get to the place where we've decided, Lord, I'm ready to let go of my my control. I'm ready to let go of my agenda, uh, and we really turn that page in our life where we are surrendering our way to his, then we begin seeing more that we need to surrender. And God opens our eyes and reveals to us. But also as we go through different stages in life, we realize that there's things that we're grabbing a hold of that we need to let go of as well. But that's the Holy Spirit convicting us. Now there are a lot of people who believe that um, not, only, not only believe that, oh, you, you were baptized, then you have the Holy Spirit. But if we're not seeing fruit of the Spirit in our lives, then that's a pretty good indication that we need to be asking God, okay, fill me with your Spirit. There are those within the church who uh, will say that they are followers of God, uh, and yet uh, they think that every living person has the Holy Spirit working in them. Um, whether they believe in Jesus or not, doesn't matter. We all have the Holy Spirit. The Unity Church puts it this way, um, <coughs> that uh, there's a little bit of God in each and every one of us as soon as we're born. Uh, but that's not scriptural. We do see a time when there are those who are filled with the Holy Spirit when the apostles are preaching to them and they realize that, oh, there are spiritual gifts here, gifts of the Holy Spirit, and there's fruit of the Spirit here. Um, and it was realized, well, if God fills them with the Holy Spirit, I guess we should go ahead and baptize them. That's early in, at the point where the Gentiles were becoming believers. And, uh, and so they realized, well, if they are becoming believers and if they're being filled with the Holy Spirit, then we should baptize. So even baptism isn't the, the magic wand. Uh, God works in different ways. It's not always exactly the same. But in this case, uh, they prayed for the new believers that they might receive the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit had not yet come on them. And they had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord. And then Peter and John placed their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. Verse 18. When Simon, we're talking about Simon the uh, sorcerer, saw that the Spirit 
was given at the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money. And he said, give me also this ability so that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. He decided, well, I, I need to add this to my uh, box of uh, influence that he was, uh, he was seen at, by the people in that community as a man of power, that had the power of God because of his sorcery. Now, I think there was probably a bit of Simon the Sorcerer that was genuine in that he believed about Jesus and he wanted uh, to be baptized and be a part of this powerful uh, ministry of God. But I think that he was still very much so a man of the world, a man desiring power and influence and uh, uh, desiring to keep his position of importance in that community that he saw slipping away. And any of us can make that decision to follow the Lord, but still have the motivation of what is in it for me. And that was Judas's difficulty. I don't think he ever got past what's in it for me. It was a difficulty for all of the disciples. You remember when... Um, when they started arguing about who was better. And you remember when um, James and John came and, and asked, uh, that, we, oh, can we be at the, your right and left hand? Uh, the motivations of the world can still get in our way. We who are in the church, we who are striving to know God. But as we get to know him more and more, we come to realize that he is the one that needs to be emphasized, not us. So Simon wanted to buy the power. Give me this power. And Peter answered, May your money perish with you because you thought you could buy the gift of God with money. You have no part or share in this ministry because your heart is not right before God. And then uh, he continues to say, Repent of this wickedness. Now, Peter is telling him, This is how you can... Um, escape the curse that you're bringing upon yourself. Repent of this wickedness and pray to the Lord in the hope that he may forgive you for having such thought in your heart. And then Simon's response at to first glance was kind of like promising, I thought. But then I realized, uh, maybe not so much. Simon, the sorcerer, said... Pray to the Lord for me so that nothing you have said may happen to me. See, he still doesn't get it. Peter had said for Simon to pray to the Lord in the hope that he may forgive you for having such a thought in your heart. And then he continues with that thought in his heart about what he's going to get out of it. And he asks them, to pray for him instead of him establishing a relationship with the Lord. We need to be talking to God and asking God his way, his plan, uh, asking him how he wants us to be working for him. In verse 23, Peter said, I see that you are full of bitterness and captive to sin. Now I want to switch back to Nehemiah. And uh, I'm going to take a peek at the time. With Nehemiah, In our reading about um, Nehemiah being the cupbearer and uh, to the king, uh, Arta Xerxes, Mary was reminding me uh, that her little trick is it's like artichoke, but uh, Arta Xerxes. 
And I, I don't have as much trouble pronouncing the name when I'm looking at the letters, but uh, at the early service, I gave the page that had his name written on it to our scripture reader, and then every time I wanted to say his name, I was switching letters in my head and couldn't, couldn't say it right. So I just said the, the, the king of Babylon. But uh, he was the, he was the cupbearer. Nehemiah was an important person and was in the life of the king every day. Because when they bring uh, wine to the king, they give it to Nehemiah. And Nehemiah takes custody of it, and he drinks some of the wine to make sure that the king isn't going to be poisoned. And if Nehemiah doesn't get sick and die, then he can bring the wine to the king for the king to drink. And he was the cupbearer. And he had been in service to the king for many years, but all of those years he never came before the king with a sad face. So when he came before the king with a sad face, uh, Artaxerxes saw this difference. And he said, why is your face so sad? And when asking, why is your face so sad, uh, he was very afraid, much afraid, we see in, here in uh, the first chapter 2, verse 1. He was very afraid about this. And he said to the king, may the king live forever. Why should my face not look sad when the king when the city where my ancestors are buried lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire. So the king asked, what do you want? He was willing to do something for Nehemiah in order that Nehemiah, his very faithful servant, would be happy again. The king only knew the happy face of Nehemiah. But to see the sad face, he was moved to want to do something for him. And so before he answered, though, in verse 2, uh, excuse me, verse 4 and the beginning of 5, we see these words. Then I prayed to the God of heaven and I answered the king. I don't suppose he took a day or two to pray. It's not like, well, I'll, I'll be back, you know. It had to have been one of those fast prayers. What do I say to the king? What do I say? He turned to God. Maybe he bowed his head. Maybe he went down on his knees. Maybe he was already on his knees before the king. I don't know. But I, I imagine that it had to have been one of those prayers where he said, Lord, almighty God, give me the right words. Let me know what to say. And he answered the king, if it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in his sight, let him send me to the city in Judah where my ancestors are buried so that I can rebuild it. And the king granted his wish. Gave him permission to go. In fact, the king gave him uh, soldiers on horseback to go with him as he went because I want you to come back safely to me. I want you to get there safely. I want you to be able to rebuild the city of Jerusalem. Build the wall around the city. It was the land where his ancestors, where Nehemiah's ancestors were buried. Yet that history, from Abram all the way through, as far as it pertains to the Hebrew people, so much of the world around them will not acknowledge its truth. And so Isaiah, and yeah, I mean, Nehemiah also asked, well, um, would you please give me the right papers, give me uh, the documents that I need to show to each of the governors in the regions that I'm going to pass through, and the governors of the, la uh, of the land all around Jerusalem so that they'll know that I come by your authority. And they'll give me safe passage. And give me the papers, the documents that I need so that when I get there, I can cut from the forest that belongs to the king of Babylon, though it's in 
the land of Israel, that I may have cut from the forest the lumber that I need to be the supports uh, within uh, of the walls and for the gates and such, uh, and uh, that I may hire the stonemasons and this and that and the other um, for the supplies. And the king grants those things. And so he gets there with that information. And, uh, and then we have the reading. Uh, in, in, once we go to chapter 4, I'm going to read a little bit to you about the results uh, that are the response. The response that he gets. The lack of welcome that he experiences. So uh, two chapters later, Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 1. When Sanballat heard that we were rebuilding the wall, he came, became angry and was greatly incensed. He ridiculed the Jews and in the presence of his associates and the army of Samaria. He said, what are these feeble Jews doing? Will they restore the wall, their wall? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they finish in a day? Can they bring the stones back to life from those heaps of rubble, burned as they are? Tobiah, the Ammonite, who was at his side, said, What they are building, even a fox climbing up on it, would break down their walls of stone. And then I'm going to jump to verse 7. Sanballat, Tobiah, the Arabs, the Ammonites, and the people of Ashdod heard that the repairs to Jerusalem's wall had gone ahead and that the gaps were being closed and they were very angry. They plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and stir up trouble against it. But we, be, but we the Israelites, prayed to our God and posted a guard day and night to meet this threat. Meanwhile, the people in Judah said, the strength of the laborers is giving out and there is so much rubble that we cannot rebuild the wall. Also our enemies said, before they know it or see us, we will be right there among them and we'll kill them and put an end to the work. The going was rough. The building of the city um, in such rubble and disrepair was, uh, was hard work and the physically and emotionally and motivationally, the, the, the people of Israel were struggling with the physical daunting of that project. But they were also struggling with that all of the peoples around them were hateful towards them. They were people from many different kingdoms uh, from far away that had been brought in and placed there to replace so many of the Jews that were scattered everywhere else. And the idea of that uh, in, in the, the warfare of those days was by mixing it up of different cultures and different histories that they couldn't come together as one people and overthrow the Babylon, uh, Babylonian control and, of the empire. And it was working. But what is the result? And by the way, what was taking place in Nehemiah's day is still taking place today. It's been going on ever since. Descendants of Ishmael, descendants of Esau, even though Esau and uh, Jacob had made up their, in their relationship, they'd come back together and they had both been blessed by the same God. And they lived in peace. But generations pass, and there's jealousy, and there's hatred, and there's a desire to just wipe out the other people. But the response in verse 9, but we prayed to our God. We prayed to our God. So what was life that like in verse 13? Therefore, 
Nehemiah writes, therefore I stationed some people behind the lowest points of the wall at the exposed places, posting them by families with their swords, spears, and bows. Don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight for your families, your sons and your daughters, your wives and your homes. Verse 16. From that day on, half of the men did the work, while the other half were equipped with spears, shields, bows, and armor. The officers posted themselves behind all the people of Judah who were building the wall. Those who carried materials did their work with one hand and held a weapon in the other. And each of the builders wore his sword at his side as he worked. Now, they didn't go out and attack the little kingdoms all around them. They went back to the work of the Lord, but they were prepared there to defend themselves. Then I said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, the work is extensive and spread out, and we are widely separated from each other along the wall. Whenever you hear the sound of the trumpet, join us there. Our God will fight for us. So we continued the work with half the men holding spears from the first light of the dawn till the stars came out. And at that time I said also to the people, have every man and his helper stay inside Jerusalem at night so they can serve us as guards by night and as workers by day. We see that that's been going on for thousands of years. Continues to go on today. And yet, those who hate Israel call Israel the little Satan. And what they call uh, the United States of America is the great Satan. And we are hated as well. Because we are, as a nation, have been those who have helped to protect and to allow Israel to defend themselves. We have very open borders in these past couple of years. And we know that there are many people who have come across. They weren't on a terrorist watch list, so they're allowed to come on into the nation from many different nations that call us enemies. We don't know when it may be likely that we have attacks in our communities. We can live in fear, we can tremble and be worried and afraid, or we can take a lesson from the people of Israel that know that, to know that it is the God of heaven, the God of all the universe, of all creation, who invites us to call him Father, our Father who art in heaven. Holy is your name. That he is a God that is very present in our lives and that we may turn to him and seek his protection, not just physically, much more importantly, spiritually, in relationship with him. And that which we cannot accomplish on our own, he can accomplish. Jesus said, pray for your enemies. Pray that the hearts and minds are changed. It may be your witness to someone that you meet regularly in the store, someone that lives in our community, someone who comes from those cultures that hate us. It may just be your prayers for those who are protesting and, and speaking hatred and murder in the cities far away from us. It may be our prayers for them, Lord, change their hearts. Change their minds. But let's pray for our enemies. We don't have any reason to hate them. We might hate the things that have been done to innocent people in Israel. We may hate the desire of others wanting to eradicate all Jews from everywhere in the world. But let's not hate them. 
Let's pray for them. Let's be available to speak kindness and to speak in kindness and with respect the truth of God to anyone we meet, just in case they may be someone who's come across the border with the hope of being part of doing us harm. May we share the love of God, the love of Jesus Christ, and the love that he puts on our hearts. That like Saul, who was killing Christians, they might come to know Jesus and become a champion of Christians. May God make it so. Uh, just a moment. We're going to go ahead and say the prayer of humble access at this time. And then you'll come up and we'll receive. So if you'll turn in your bulletin to that prayer. We do not presume to come to your table, gracious Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but rather in your many and great mercies. We know that we are not worthy to gather crumbs under your table, but you, O oh Lord, are merciful. Therefore, grant us this privilege to partake of the sacrament of your Son, Jesus Christ, so we may walk in that newness of life, which is to grow into his likeness and forever dwell in him, and he in us. Amen. Now I invite you to, uh, if you don't have to be a member of this church, but if in your heart you desire to be a follower of Jesus walking in his way, uh, I invite you to come to him in faith and receive the bread and the grape juice as the body of Christ and the blood of Christ for the atonement of your sins. And uh, come and come and receive.
I invite you to turn to the, the verse there, something beautiful, stand to sing. Thank you. 